Western prayer researchers today identify four modalities of prayer. They say when we pray in the West, we use one or some combination of these four modes of prayer. Uh, the first is an informal prayer that's called a colloquial prayer. Uh, I had a friend of mine that lived in, uh, in the Bay Area in San Francisco that would say this informal prayer coming home from work uh, every Friday on, on, the, uh, on the interstate. Dear God, if you let me get to the Conoco station before my tank runs out of gas, I'll never let my tank get this low again. Uh, and that is an informal prayer to God. Uh, the second mode of prayer is what is called a petitionary prayer where we petition the powers to be. We petition the angel or angels or we petition God. Amen. Dear God, I, uh, I claim the right to heal and be healed now in all past, present, future manifestations. That would be a petitionary kind of prayer. The third mode of prayer is a ritualistic prayer. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep. God is great. God is good. And the fourth mode of prayer is a prayer that has no words. It's simply a, a meditative prayer where we become aware of, uh, of a presence around us and in the silence. Uh, and there's some uh, dispute as to whether or not this is even a mode of prayer or not. But this is the way Western prayer researchers typically think of prayer in our world today. And as good as those modes are, and as, as well as they describe the way we pray, there's always been another mode, a fifth mode, that is not described in these uh, modalities. And this is precisely what the abbot in Tibet was describing to us. He was describing a mode of prayer that's based in feeling. And he said, we must feel the feeling as if the prayer has already been answered. And in that feeling, we are speaking to the forces of creation, allowing the world to respond to us, allowing this field, the quantum hologram, the mind of God, to respond to us with what it is that we are feeling within our hearts. So, rather than praying and feeling powerless in a given situation, dear God, please let there be peace in the world. This mode of prayer invites us to feel as if we are participating in that peace, just as John Wheeler suggested, that we are part of all that we see. And as we feel the peace in our world or the healing in the bodies of our loved ones, we are actually empowering the field to mirror that back to us uh, in a way that will bring those changes about in our lives and in our world. Well, this is precisely what the abbot was saying to us in the monastery in Tibet. In the early 1990s, I had the opportunity to see this mode of prayer, this feeling-based prayer, uh, enacted in, in a real-time situation. And I'd like to share the story because it, it perhaps best describes what otherwise is, uh, is a nebulous concept uh, regarding precisely how feeling-based prayer works in our lives. During the 1990s, early 1990s, the desert southwest was experiencing one of the worst droughts in history. And a Native American friend of mine invited me to join him one day in a place in the high deserts of northern New Mexico to share in a prayer of rain. He didn't have to ask me twice. I said, you bet, I'd love, I'd love to participate and see what this prayer is all about. So we met at a, uh, an agreed upon location and we hiked uh, through several uh, hundred thousand acres of beautiful high mountain desert sage until we came to a place that was so old uh, even the people today don't know who built this place. It was essentially a stone circle. And each stone was placed just as it was by the hands of the ancestors so long ago. And it was in this place that my friend began uh, his prayer. What he did was he removed his shoes, stepped into the circle in his bare feet. He honored all of his ancestors. He simply said, all of my ancestors, all of my ancestors. Honored the four directions. He turned his back to me held his hand in a prayer position just a few seconds. And then he turned around and looked at me and he said, I'm hungry, let's go get a bite to eat. And I said, I thought you were going to share this prayer. I thought you were gonna pray for rain. And he looked at me and he said, no. He said, because if we prayed for rain, rain could never happen. Because the moment you pray for something to occur, you've just acknowledged that it does not exist in that moment. And I thought about what he said. It made a lot of sense to me. If I say, dear God, please let there be peace in the world, what I'm saying in that moment is that peace isn't there. And I may inadvertently 
be empowering the very condition that I would like to change. And the same with a healing in my body or the body of my loved ones. So I asked my friend, I said, if you didn't pray for rain just then, what, what did you just do? What happened when you closed your eyes? And you turned your back to me just for those few moments. And what he said was this. He said, when I closed my eyes, I began to feel the feeling of what it feels like to have rain in our Pueblo village. He said, I smelled the smells of what it smells like when the rain falls off the earth and walls of our buildings. And I felt the feeling of what it feels like with my naked feet in the mud. There's so much mud because there's been so much rain. And he said, in that way, I opened the door to the possibility to bring rain into our world. Well, I think about this mode of prayer a lot. Later that afternoon, something amazing happened. I was watching the weather maps, and the drought that had happened for so long suddenly changed. We saw the high-pressure system move across Utah and then dip down from Colorado into northern New Mexico and make a little U-turn and come right back up. We had rain that night. We had rain all the next day. It rained and rained, and I called my friend. And I asked him, I said, there's so much rain. The valleys are flooding. The roads are flooding. What in the world is going on? And he was quiet just for a moment, and he said, that's the part of the prayer. He said, I never quite figured it out. So I have no way of scientifically validating that my friend's prayer had anything to do with that rain. But the correlations are so high. We see it happen so many times, we know there is an effect. 1972, 24 United States cities were used to conduct an experiment where people were trained to feel the feeling of peace in a very specific manner, and they were strategically, strategically placed in these cities. Each city had populations over 10,000 people. Uh, and these were documented in some of the very well-known uh, uh, TM studies that were done uh, back in the, uh, in the early 70s. And what happened was, during the time that the people were feeling the feelings of peace, in the community around them, beyond the buildings where they were having their experience, the communities experienced statistically measurable reductions in crime, violent crimes against people, traffic accidents declined. Uh, in some cities like Chicago, where the stock exchanges, the stock market soared while peace was in place. And when they stopped their prayers, all those statistics reversed. And they did this time and time again to such a degree that the effect could be measured and it was applied in an even greater experiment that was uh, documented in the Journal of Conflict Resolution. 1988. And this was the experiment. It was called the International Peace Project in the Middle East. And what happened during the Israeli-Lebanese War in the early 1980s as a result of these earlier studies? People who were trained to feel the feelings of peace were positioned throughout the war-torn areas in Israel and Lebanon. And during the time, what the researchers called the window, the prayer window, when they were feeling People were trained to feel the feelings of peace in their hearts. When they were feeling those feelings, terrorist activities dropped to zero. Crimes against people declined. Emergency hospital room visits declined. And they tried doing these experiments different times of day, uh, different days of the week to make sure it wasn't an effect of, of weeks or weekends or holidays or, or different times of the month to make sure it wasn't an effect of lunar cycles affecting people. And when the studies were complete, what they found, although we may not know precisely why this effect happens the way it happens. We know the correlations are so high that when a certain number of people begin to feel the feeling of peace or healing in their bodies in one place, the effect carries into the community beyond the place where these people are. And it is so precise that we now know, the statisticians were able to determine precisely the number of people that are required to kickstart, to jumpstart this kind of an effect. So I'll share the, uh, the formula and then I'll describe what that formula means. The effect is first noticed when a certain number of people are participating. And that number, the minimum number, is the square root of 1% of a given population. So what does that mean? If you have a city of 1 million people, for example, you take 1% of 1 million, on your little calculator, and then you take the square root of whatever that 1% was, and that number tells you how many people are necessary, the threshold number to begin the effect. Obviously, the more people that participate, uh, the greater the effect. 
Uh, for a city of one million people, that number is only about 100. In a world of six billion people, the square root of 1% of the given population is only about 8,000 people. 8,000 people, according to these studies, are the number of people, that's all that's required, to feel the feelings of peace in their hearts in a given moment in time, simultaneously, to kickstart, to jumpstart that consciousness linked through the field, as we know the field exists today, before that peace is felt in the world around us.